good morning. It is a delight, a privilege to be with you. Uh, I have not had an opportunity to talk directly to you lately. We had the gospel meeting that was a great effort. Uh, listened to Brother Lonnie's comments last week about uh, the good week we had, and it was a tremendous week. Uh, then I was in a meeting this past week. It was less good because I was the one doing the preaching. Uh, that meeting was, they didn't have the benefit of having somebody else. Uh, but uh, I was able to go and be with the Summerton congregation, and it was a it was a good week. They are a smaller group, uh, but lots of visitors each night, uh, non Christians, visitors from different kinds of congregations, and glad that we were able to spend that week together. And uh, I was very encouraged and benefited by that time together. But all that being said, is I am I am glad to be home uh, and uh, glad to be with you and to have this time. Uh, together. Uh, I'm going to take my Bible now, grab it. Um, and if you, you might turn your Bibles to Titus chapter 3, that's where we're going to look. We have been looking over the course of this year at the book of Titus, and my plan is to finish that up today. And you might say, well, what, last time you only covered four verses, and now you've got to cover a whole chapter. Can you do it? And I've got all the time today that I need. So, um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm glad that we get to finish up this book of Titus. I think it's been a good study for me and I uh, hope that we can finish it off well. We have, we have lots of visitors here with us today um, and I am thankful for that. And if we can be an encouragement to you and help you in any way we want to, uh, if anything I say raises questions, if the things that we do together raises questions, um, the group here, I think almost every person would be ready to talk about that. And uh, if, uh, if they don't know the answer, then we can continue to seek that out because we want, to do, we want to do right and we want to do things that honor and please God. And if something you see that we're doing, you don't think honors and pleases God or that we're missing something, then we want to do better and we want to be more what God would have us to be. So we're studying the book of Titus. And the, the structure of this letter, I think, is, is really beautiful. He starts off with an introduction, basically talking to Titus about the great hope that we have because we have our confidence in a God who cannot lie and who has promised us eternal life. But immediately after this great opening of promises, turns to Titus and tells him that there's some pretty ne necessary tasks that need to be handled. And specifically, he talks about Titus finishing up the work of putting these congregations in place with the appointment of elders, with the appointment of leaders in those local churches. And the primary reason for that, at least as Paul addresses it in this letter, is because there are false teachers out there. There are teachers who are coming in and they are wreaking havoc in people's homes and in people's families by leading them away from the truth and leading them into false doctrine. And it's not just that these people are wrong on an issue of two and that it can be straightened out. It's that they're, they're wild beasts. They're animals. They're wreaking havoc on people's families. And he says they are unfit for any good work. These are completely deranged people when it comes to spiritual things. And so what Paul tells Titus to do is that in face of those false teachers, he's supposed to install godly men, people who have been shaped and taught by the grace of God, they are to be installed as leaders in order to, to shut down these false doctrines so that these false teachers can be silenced. And then Titus, in contrast, in chapter 2 and verse 1, Paul tells him that he is supposed to speak the things that are fitting for sound doctrine. So we have the introduction, and then we have the instruction to uh, appoint elders in view of these false teachers. And then right in the core, I think all the way from chapter 2, verse 1, all the way down maybe even to chapter 3, verse 8, we have what I think is the core of the letter, which is instruction in view of the grace of God. We have titled this series, His Grace Reaches and Teaches Me. And I think if we wanted to summarize the book of Titus, I think that's a pretty good way to do it. Because he talks a lot in this section about the goodness and the kindness, the grace and the mercy and the price that was paid for us by the grace of God. So we, we've talked a lot about that. But within that, never out of view. Always right, on the, uh, right following that. And sometimes even preceding that kind of talk is instructions about the way we ought to live. 
And I think really the key passage that we would look at in that would be Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. That the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. That is, the gift of salvation is laid at the feet of every single person, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, rich, poor, whatever. It's laid at their feet, ready to be opened. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people. But notice it's not just the gift of salvation that's being offered. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, teaching us, verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that is, rejecting a way of life that lives without God in view and lives in view of just our, pas uh, our, our passions and our desires, rejecting that, denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We live soberly, he says. That is, we live with a sense of the danger of the world around us. We live with clear thinking. We live soberly. We live righteously. We see the right standard to which God has called us to. And we're consistently trying to shape and mold our lives in that. We live soberly, righteously, and godly. And that idea of godly is that we live we take every step with an awareness that God sees. So whether that is a, a difficult step that we have to take, we say, God sees this. He knows the difficulty that I'm about to encounter. He knows the weight of this, and He's watching. Or if it's a step where we, we, we want help in this, we, we pray to God and we say we need help in this direction, and when we live in godliness, we always want to take the right step because we see that God's eye is always on us in good and, uh, and, and really in judgment terms. I don't want to take the wrong step because I live godly. I live with an awareness that God is always watching. So, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation as we sing. His grace reaches me. But also, maybe we could have a second stanza or a third stanza of that song. His grace teaches me. His grace teaches me. Because within the grace of God, there is this powerful call to be more than what we once were. And we're going to echo that as we look at chapter 3 for a little while today. Now, I want you to think what Paul has called these people to. He has called them to reject ungodliness and worldly lust, lust and to live these sober, righteous, godly lives. And notice in chapter 2, at the end of that chapter, in verse, uh, the end of verse 12, godly, in the present age. Now, I think that's an important phrase. They are not being completely delivered out of the present age. That is, they're not removed and separated from that. They're still right in the middle of whatever their present age was. And we get a little bit of a description of that. Back in chapter 1, uh, and uh, when you think about what he says in chapter 1 and verse 12, they, these people are from the island of Crete. And here's the kind of people that lived on Crete. Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And Paul is not saying that on his own. One of, their, one of the Cretan poets wrote that about them. And Paul says, and he was right about that. So here, he's calling these people's, people to lives of holiness and good works and godliness. And the people around them, what are they? They are liars and they are evil beasts and they are lazy gluttons. And so when you think about the high calling that Paul has called Titus to preach and you think about the low lives of the people around them, you might wonder how in the world are the people that Titus is preaching to, how are they going to manage this? How are they going to operate in a world like that? And let me say this, that we might look around at our world and we see the calling that God has given us and we see the people around us and the challenges that we have to face, whether it's who you work with or maybe who your family is or whatever it might be, and we say, we've got to figure out how to live soberly righteously and godly, and I have to live and work and share a community with people like this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to manage? And I think Paul gives us some instructions. I think Paul gives Titus instructions to give to the Cretans. And let me tell you this, that if the Cretans can learn how to live in their world soberly, righteously, and godly in their present age, then in our present age, with people around us who are liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, we can learn how to live soberly, righteously, and godly. And I like this at the end, verse 15. He says, These speak, things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And when I read the book of Titus, I think, reprove with 
authority, why does he have to have such a, a hard stance? Why does he have to come with such power? Why is he worried about somebody disregarding him? I think it's because the call is going to be a great challenge when you consider the highness of it and, and the, the world in which they live. So really what I want to do is I want to work through chapter 3 and see what Paul wants Titus to teach them as we go. And the first thing that we notice, this is in chapter 3 and verse 1. And I'm sorry it's cut off over there on the side. I, I don't know uh, why that's the case, but it's, uh, I'm going to blame it on the projector. Um, so the first point that Titus, Paul wants Titus to emphasize authoritatively and not be disregarded by, of course we've got all of chapter 2, but when he zooms in, he says, you remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to slander no one, to be peaceable, considerate, demonstrating all gentleness to all men. On the island of Crete, if they are all liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons, what do you think their leaders looked like? I think they probably were the very representatives of all of those characteristics. And I know that we have frustrations with our leaders because there are so many times where they are exposed because they literally are liars. You know, we have this, this thing on social media now called fact-checking. Just spend some time fact-checking a politician. Talk about evil beasts. There are decisions that our leaders make sometimes that I think if we, if we saw the consequences of those decisions and maybe even if we knew what they knew about the consequences that would come from those decisions, we would say, evil beasts. I just I, I love history. And so I think about uh, President Eisenhower's speech, his farewell address. I was not there for that. Some of you were, but I was not. Um, and uh, he gives this farewell address where he's worried about the military industrial complex. And what he said was, is we have this whole society, this whole section of our economy that's being built up on the building of weapons. And he says, you know what that's going to encourage? That's going to encourage us looking for opportunities to go fight so that we have somewhere to use these weapons. And isn't that the way you feel? Like we're always looking for a fight and, and it, it seems like things are being destroyed all over the place. And, and, and I have to tell you this, I think some of the people whose pocketbooks are helped by selling weapons are the people who are leading us. So we've got liars and what I would call evil beasts. And then you think about the ways in which these people make their money. Could we call them lazy gluttons? I think probably they are the very representatives in so many cases. Not every one of them, maybe not even them, I don't know. But I just have a feeling that when we look at our leaders, I think that's what we're seeing. And so Paul says, completely disregard them. Don't listen to a word they say. Go on living your lives as if they didn't exist. That's not what he says, is it? That might be the way we would think that righteous, holy people are supposed to, to treat their leaders. But really what he says is you remind them to be subject to those rulers and authorities. You instruct them to be obedient. Now I have a feeling that Paul, uh, Titus standing in a pulpit in a Cretan congregation would have to say that pretty authoritatively and would have to be aware that people were going to disregard him. And depending on the direction of our nation, I think that that call to call people to be obedient and to, to be respectful of our authorities, I think that's going to get to be a harder call all the time. And yet, in view of the grace of God, that's what we are called to be. He says not only that, we want to be ready for every good work. That is a key phrase in the book of Titus. The false teachers who came were not fit for any good work. And yet what Titus is supposed to be, he's supposed to be a model of good works, verse 7, so that he can remind the people that God sent Jesus to die for us so that He would redeem us and make us His special people who are zealous for good works, chapter 2, verse 14. So false teachers can't teach good works because they're not involved in them. Titus is supposed to be full of good works so that he can call them to be people who are zealous for good works. And they're going to need to be reminded of that. 
because they're going to go out into the world where people are not concerned about good works. They're going to be concerned about getting what's theirs and stepping on whoever they have to. And how much of a reminder do we need when we deal in a crooked and untoward generation, when we deal in a wicked world, how much reminder do we need to consistently be thinking, I've got to be involved in good works. I think I need that reminder pretty regularly because I see other people who are using their opportunities for just their own personal gain, and I don't want to do that. I don't want to use the opportunities just for me, and I don't want to step on other people to get where I need to be. Not speaking evil of people. It's easy to do, isn't it? Because we get the newspaper, and we get insight into all the backroom dealings that have been made in local politics. Or we get to see people reported about in the newspaper and all the bad things they did. And it is so easy to just slander and speak badly and run them down the road about the bad things that they've done. We, we could do that, couldn't we? About the crete we live in. To avoid quarreling. It is to be peaceable. With them? With the evil beasts? I think he's talking not just about how we treat brethren. I think he's talking about how we treat everybody because he says that we, in verse 2, are demonstrating all gentleness or all meekness or all courtesy to all men. I think that's everybody. Now, of course, there's going to be a special relationship between brethren and we want to treat one another with greater preference and honor. But that courtesy, that gentleness, that kindness... For everybody. And that's a high call. And that's how we're to act toward the world. So I think that this kind of instruction would require the kind of authoritative declaration, the kind of reproof that Paul calls Titus to offer because it was going to be a challenging thing to talk about. And I think it's a challenging thing for us from time to time to be obedient and be in submission to the governing authorities, to not speak evil of people, to avoid quarreling, to show all courtesy to all men. We need to keep reminding ourselves that that is how people who are redeemed out of this present age continue to operate within it. Now, in order to make the case that that's what people need to do, Paul says in verse 3, For we ourselves also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, despicable, hating one another. That word for at the beginning of verse 3 is the word that we could render because of or in view of this. That is, he says, we are to treat them that way because consider how we once lived. Consider who you once were. And I don't know how long you spent living in this kind of life, but all of us have spent some time living like the people in verse 3. We were all at one time foolish. I think generally in the Bible when we talk about foolish, we're talking about somebody who lives for some period of time in their life as if there was no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, Psalm 14 says. I think that's what it means to live in foolishness. We were all disobedient. We were all deceived, tricked, lied to by Satan and the world. And we were all, to one degree or another, enslaved to some lust and to some pleasure. We all spent our life in malice and envy and and were despicable and hated one another. In, In some way, I don't know that we were all in every way guilty of all of those things, but to some degree, whether it was in our treatment of other people, whether it was in our attitude towards what I should get out of life, or whether it was in my attitude towards God. So whether it was towards God, foolishness or some disobedience, or towards myself, deceived and enslaved to passions, or in my treatment of other other people, malice, envy, despicable, hating one another. I think that might be the order there. God... my my sense of myself and my treatment of others. In some way, and probably to some degree in every way, we were all once there. That's how we all once lived. So, we look around at the people in the world, and if we fail to say, I was right where they are at one point, it's a lot easier to dismiss them and disregard them and mistreat them, isn't it? 
But as soon as I think of myself having been in the position in which they are in myself, all of a sudden, I may hate the things that they're doing. I may loathe the way that they're living. But I can't look down my nose at them in pride as if I have never lowered myself to such a place. Because I have. Because I have. And if you're a Christian, if you're a person who's a disciple of Jesus, you've acknowledged that. You, you've, you've, you've said that. You turned away from that. But it didn't remove, remove where we once were, as Paul reminds us. And then he says, let's talk about the, to them about where, how we got where we are. And this is where we'll spend some time. He says in verse 4, some time. You say your time is running out. I understand. We, this is how we once were. This is how we got to where we are. Verse 4, but when the kindness and affection of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by His grace, we would become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So what he says here is not only were we once there, we are where we are now, not because we live such shining moral lives that God said, well, I'm going to make those my people. We live lives when we were in foolish, disobedient, deceived living, we were saved by His kindness and affection. We were saved, as Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, by the grace of God that has appeared, bringing salvation to us. He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness. I think the point of that is to say that He did not save us because of who we were. We weren't saved because of the works that we were doing in righteousness, because we were just passing the test. He saved us not by works which we did in righteousness, but according to His mercy. He saved us not because of who we were, but because of who He is. That's why we were saved. We were saved in spite of the lives that we were coming from, not because we had done such a jolly job that God said, I'm going to make those people mine, but because we were wretches and God saved us. Christ has regarded my helpless estate, we just sang. And that's why we can say it as well with my soul. Not because my estate wasn't helpless, but because Christ has regarded it and my sins are nailed to His cross. That's why I can say it as well. He may even be pointing to some of the false teachers and the things that they were saying. In verse 10 of chapter 1, he says, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. I think when we read the book of Romans and the book of Galatians, I think these who are teaching that the Gentiles have to submit to the Jewish regulations of what it means to be one of the people of God, that now they are being saved by works. And I think he's pointing away from that and saying we are saved by grace and by mercy. He mentions two phrases that maybe we have some questions about but that I think are, are powerful. He says the washing of regeneration. What is he talking about when the, with the washing of regeneration? Well, there's only one thing in the Scriptures that I know of that is both a washing and something that gives new life. There's only one moment where we can look at it as something that is cleansing and, and, and something that gives us new birth or resurrection life, however we want to phrase that. In John chapter 3, Jesus was having a conversation with a man named Nicodemus. And Jesus says, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again when he's old? Can he enter again into his mother's womb? No. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about entering your mother's womb again and being born all over again. He says, unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's he talking about? Well, just think about Paul's own experience. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Paul is sitting there blinded. He is, he's seen Jesus on the road to Damascus. The man named Ananias comes into Damascus to talk to Saul. And what does he tell him? And now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Notice what's being pictured here. A washing. Washing away your sins. How? By being baptized 
which is the way in which we call upon the name of the Lord. Now this washing is not about what the water does to our outer body. As Peter reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, baptism now saves you, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not that the dirt gets washed off my skin. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is, when I want a clean conscience, when I'm crying out to God asking, can you clean my conscience? The answer of a good conscience is baptism now saves us. Because that is the moment where we come into contact with the power of the blood of Jesus and the authority of His resurrection. And talk about new life. You think about what happens in our baptism. And of course, I love the passage in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. In Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 11, he says, You were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Uh, this is verse 11, made without hands in the removal of the body, the flesh, and the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with Him, in which you were also raised up with Him through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. And you, being dead in your transgressions, He made you alive with Him, having graciously forgiven all our transgressions. What could better describe regeneration than you being dead in your trespasses and sins and being made alive together with Christ. That sounds like regeneration, doesn't it? And when does that happen? When you are buried with Him in baptism. And how does it happen? Because He graciously forgave us all our transgressions. The end of verse 12, 13 says in Colossians 2. And so that washing of regeneration, I think he's pointing back to that moment when we were buried with Christ in baptism and we had our sins washed away and we were raised up to walk in newness of life, no longer enslaved to sin. So how can I be obedient to these civil authorities? How is it they're going to be peaceable? How is it that I can be courteous to all people? It's because you once were where they were and the reason you are where you are now is because God washed you and raised you. And then he says that we get the renewal of the Spirit. Now, Brother Lonnie talked last week about what the Holy Spirit does to us. And one of the things it does is He renews us. He makes us new from the inside out. He changes us. Now, there are a lot of ideas about how the Holy Spirit does that. I'm going to let Mr. Lonnie cover that in his next lesson. I'm not going to give it away. So you thought you might get an answer, but no, you got to still wait some But He does renew us. He does change us from the inside out. And, and what that means is, is we are who we are, not because of our bright ideas, but because of what the Spirit has done to our inner man, to our inner woman, changing us and making us what we ought to be. So that we can say, along with Romans chapter 12 and verses 1 and 2, that our minds are renewed. So that we're not conformed to this world, to the Cretes or to the Franklin counties where we live but that we are transformed by the renewing of your, our mind so that we can offer to God that sacrifice that we give Him. And then I love this. He says not only the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That language of pouring out the Spirit. I want you to see that the way that the Spirit is being poured out on us is through Jesus Christ. That's interesting, right? How does He pour out the Spirit through Jesus Christ? Can you flip over for just a moment? I've not had you turn away from that much, but in Romans 5 and in verse 5, there's a similar phrase. It's not exactly the same, but you can hear some of the same language. And I want you to see if you notice that. This is verse 5. And hope does not put to shame because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So you hear that language of pouring out? But now it's the love of God that's being poured out through the Holy Spirit. But I want you to notice verse 6. For, because, this is how that happened, because while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you see the connection there? I think what Paul is saying in Romans 5 and I would take it to be what he's saying in, in Titus 3, is that the Holy Spirit was poured out on us when Jesus died for our sins and we were able to receive the benefits of that. That is the way in which the Spirit was poured out. 
That's the way in which God's love was poured out through the Spirit, was in what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And one of the things that helps me think about how that's the case is an Old Testament prophecy. This is in Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3, and I want you to listen to the language here. So we've got God's love being poured out through the Spirit because Jesus died for us. We've got the Holy Spirit being poured out on us through Jesus Christ. Look at Isaiah 44 and verse 3. For I will pour out water on the thirsty ground and streams on the dry land. I will pour out My Spirit on your seed and My blessing on your offspring. It seems to me that when God talks about pouring out His Spirit, He is talking about the benefits and the blessings that He will pour out through the power of the Spirit. But how does that get poured out? Through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. And so you have in verse 4 of Isaiah 44, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. This one will say, I am the Lord's. And this one will call on the name of Jacob. And this will write on his hand, belonging to the Lord, and will name Israel's name with honor. What does it mean for God to pour out His Spirit? What does it mean to pour out His blessings, according to Isaiah 44? It means to make people who were not one of His people. It means to make a new people by pouring out the blessings. And how does He do that? Well, He pours out His love through the Spirit, through Christ, who while we were still ungodly, died for our sins. I think that ties Romans, 3, Romans 5 and Titus 3 all together because I think the theme may very well be the same. Who we once were and how we got to where we are. Now, I want you to look at verse 8, summarizing how we ought to live in view. This is a trustworthy statement, he says. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently so that those who have believed in God will be intent to lead in good works. These things are good and profitable for men. That's the goal of what God is doing. This is the faithful saying. This is the trustworthy thing. This is what it all comes down to. In view of what God has done for us, those who have believed in God, those who have put their faith and their confidence in Him, they're to be leaders in good works. Because God's grace reaches us and teaches us that those are the kinds of things we ought to be involved in. And I love that he says at the end of verse 8, these things are good and profitable for men. I think he's saying that because God's grace has reached us and teached, taught us, that we, because of God's grace, can reach out and teach others about God's grace. And that would be profitable to all men because of the way that we live our lives. Now very quickly... I'm already out of time, but I just want you to see what he says about false teachers. Let's just go ahead and read from verse 9 to the end. He says, But avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and conflicts about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help send Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that nothing is lacking for them. And our people must also learn to lead in good works, to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. I think he gives two instructions as he closes out. And the first one is to handle false teachers by rejecting them. Now, when he talks about these controversies about the law and about genealogies, I think he is referencing those fellows from chapter 1 verse 10 that are emphasizing the circumcision. Because imagine what they're able to do. Well, God said that Abraham was going to be blessed. And he had a son named Isaac. And he had a son named Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons. Where do you fit in that genealogy? You know? or contentions about the law. Now, when he says, avoid those foolish controversies and strife and conflict about the law, I don't think he's saying, don't answer the bad claims. I think he's saying, you don't even need to give them the time of day anymore. 
I think he's saying you just reject that. You give, you can give a biblical answer for how to reject it. I think that's what the book of Romans and Galatians are about, is how you can reject these kind of calls for people to be circumcised in order to stand in right condition before God. It can be rejected. In fact, if they've already heard Paul's instructions on it, which likely they have, because this is a long time after Paul wrote Romans, and a long time after he wrote Galatians, if they've heard Paul's instructions about it, and these guys come again and again and again, still proclaiming those false doctrines, have nothing to do with them. Because those people have demonstrated that they don't want to listen, that they're not interested in what you have to say, that man must be perverted, he must be twisted, he is sinning, and he is self-condemned, as demonstrated by his refusal to listen to the instructions that we are saved in Christ, not in circumcision. And then, how do we lead in good works? We have that phrase uh, in in the end of verse fourteen, or in the middle of verse fourteen. Our people must also learn to lead in good works. How do we do that? Well, notice the things he says. When these people come, you come to me, Titus. And when these people come, y'all help them on their way. One of the ways to lead in good works is to help those who are trying to preach, who are trying to do good. Can you all do that? Yes, I know you can because you do. You help me in my preaching. You help those who are trying to teach. You help those who are trying to do good. We can be leaders in good works. That's one of our focuses as we look for opportunities to help. He wants them to learn to lead in good works, to meet pressing needs so that they will not be unfruitful. Do you know of any pressing needs that our congregation has right now? Do you know of any people in our group that have pressing needs that are on them? Do you think you could look for opportunities to meet those? That's how you lead in good works. And then, I love these final words, all who are with me greet you, greet those who love us in the faith. It's almost like he's talking about treating one another like family. Embracing one another like family. We want to send good greetings to you. And then he says, as his final words to Titus, grace be with you all. Grace summarizing all that God has done for us. What he wants is that the grace of God, the favor, the gift that reaches us and teaches us, he wants all of them to have that. He wants all of them to be people that the grace of God has appeared to. He wants them to have the salvation and He wants them to be taught to reject ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. He wants them to be the people who are redeemed from lawlessness and purified to be a people who are zealous for good works. He wants them to be people who are able to be reminded and instructed in these ways, recognizing that it was not because of who we were, but because of who God is, that He washed us, washed us, He regenerated us, He renewed us by His Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. And so we come to a close in the book of Titus. If you need the reaching and the teaching of God's grace if you want the salvation that God offers and want to be taught how to live in view of it, we just want to help and encourage you. If I was to bury you in this watery grave, if I was to immerse you in water, it would be nothing about who I am. It would be all about who God is and what He has accomplished in Christ. That because of His kindness and affection, He washes us clean from our sins and regenerates us to new resurrection life that He renews us. He begins to change us from the inside out by the Holy Spirit that He has poured out on us through Jesus Christ. And when that happens, I I, I think this is just for a moment. I just want you to think about this. When you get ready to come be baptized, we may be in a hurry to try to get the waiters on and to get the towels ready and all that. But I don't want to rush the process. When you get ready to be baptized, my first inclination is not somebody run, go cut the water on and get the waiters. I'm going to say, are you ready to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age? Are you ready to lay your life down for the Lord? Are you ready in view of the kindness and affection that He has shown you to give it all up for Him? And if you say yes... Jesus is Lord, 
I will go where He says go. I will do what He calls me to do. I will reject what He tells me to reject. I am in. Then we'll rush to get the waiters. But baptism is not just something that we check off a list just to make sure that we've been washed and that our ticket is punched. Baptism is the moment where we give our allegiance to Jesus as Lord and where we come out of the power of darkness and under the dominion of God's beloved Son. And we receive forgiveness. And we receive hope. And we receive the anticipation of the day of Jesus Christ, the one who redeemed us from all lawlessness and purified us to be His people who are zealous for good works. You ready for that? If you're ready for that, then I wouldn't wait to come forward so that you can have your sins washed away and you can be part of the family and the kingdom of our God. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing? Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.